Amen. Glory to God. Well, go ahead and open your Bibles up to Mark chapter 3, verse 7. Mark chapter 3, verse 7. We're continuing the title from last week, which is Jesus picked who? Everybody say who? He, he picked who? We're looking at the team Jesus assembled. Now, we know some dream teams throughout history, don't we? Some teams that, that were amazing. Everybody wanted to watch them play. Here's a picture with some dream teams from yesteryear. You remember them, right? The Miracle on Ice, the men's uh, Olympic hockey team, and oh my goodness, the dream team for USA men's basketball, Dicka, and the 85 Da Bears. Am I right? Dream teams, am I right? Maybe you didn't know about this latest dream team just down the street, Chicago Christian High School, the Knights. Check it out. They are in the playoffs. And uh, they just won their first playoff game last night. They, uh, they slaughtered the other team. Uh, home field, this is, of course, my son's football team. And here's, here's the next picture. So they're now going down to Bloomington next Saturday for their second playoff game. They are a dream team. They might be the best team in the history of their school. So I'm a proud parent. Hey, we know a dream team when we see it, right? And we know a dream team when we don't see it. Am I right? And all the Bears fans said amen. <laughs> Jesus did not pick a dream team. What we are going to learn this week and next week as we meet the rest of the apostles is there was nothing special about them. They were not the super saints. They were not the elite. They were not the ones who mastered the Bible. They didn't have amazing gifts. They weren't dynamic personalities. Uh, in fact, as the persecution would intensify, every last one of them would abandon Jesus. Jesus chose them? But we're going to meet the apostles this week, next week. We're going to see that Jesus did transform them into eyewitnesses, messengers, miracle workers, shepherds, and martyrs. What we're going to learn is if he can use them, them, he can use you. And we're also going to learn from their testimony that if they believed it, if they authenticated that Jesus was the Messiah, we should believe it too. Let's pray and then we'll get into Mark chapter 3 together. Lord, show us your glory through your apostles. Show us how you transformed them, saved them, empowered them, turned them into bold witnesses that turned the entire Roman Empire upside down. Show us through their failures, their folly, that you can use fools like them, you can use fools like us. Help us to become bold witnesses of you, Jesus. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Okay, Mark chapter 3, verse 7. Let's read what's going on here in the life of Christ, the ministry of Christ. It says, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great crowd followed from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and Idumea, and from beyond the Jordan and from around Tyre and Sidon, when the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him. Can you imagine? Can you imagine people coming from all over the country, all over the coming, huge crowds, great crowds? What was Jesus going to do? He was going to empower his disciples and raise up apostles to share his work and to be his witnesses. So it says in verse 9, he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. For he had healed many, so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. Whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God! He strictly ordered them not to make him known. Now, we've already covered all of the topics here, the demon possession, the healing. We've spent several weeks on that. The point I want you to see here is the crowds are growing and Jesus is going to send out more workers into the field. So reading on in verse 13, and he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired. And they came to him and he appointed 12 whom he also named apostles so that they might be with him and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. He appointed the 12. Okay, before we meet them, the title apostle means sent ones. It's a general term that throughout the book of Acts in the Bible could refer to missionaries, church planners, pastors. So there were many apostles with the lowercase a. They were sent out ones. We also are all sent out as Christians on the Great Commission. 
So in a sense, we are all sent out ones. But these 12 were the capital A apostles. They held the office of the apostle. And there was only 12 of them. And then who betrayed Jesus? Judas. So he went down. Then they replaced him with another guy. And then uh, they raised up, who was the last apostle, the one abnormally born? Paul. And he came onto the scene kind of right after James was put to death. So basically, there were about 12 of them at all times, 12 apostles, and only these 12, plus the two bonuses, who, who laid the foundation for the early church. So the apostles were appointed by Jesus. They were eyewitnesses of the resurrection. They were chosen by Christ directly, empowered to perform miraculous signs and wonders and authority to teach the gospel and even to write books or oversee the writing of scripture. It's a very special role and only these 12, 14 guys were called into that role. There are no capital A apostles alive today. And anyone who's telling you they are on par with the apostles is deceiving you. So the apostles he is going to appoint would lay the foundation for the early church. Who were they? Well, write this down, number one. Let's review those we already met. We've already met five of them. So we're going to review for the first point the five we've already met. And then the rest of this sermon will meet three more. That'll be the second point. Then next week we'll meet the rest of them. But let's review those we already met. Peter, write this down. Peter was the chief leader of the twelve. And it goes on to say in verse 16, he appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter. So Simon was his name. Jesus gave him a nickname, Peter, which means the rock or rock. And Jesus gave him this name the first day he met him. At the John the Baptist men's wilderness retreat, Jesus met Simon. Simon, you will be called Peter. And Peter was like, huh? Jesus sent him back to fishing. For the next year or two, depending on how you date the New Testament, Peter was just fishing, and then he'd go on an itinerant tour with Jesus. They'd go back to the boat. So there were several staggered callings of these men. Now this is the official calling of the twelve. So they were wondering how the team was going to be brought together. Peter, of course, was brought by his brother Andrew. Jesus called him Peter the moment he met him, meaning Jesus knew his entire future. And this tells us who Jesus was looking for. A fisherman brought to Jesus by his fisherman brother. Peter's a guy who talks too much. Says he's brave, but he's really a coward. Says what everybody's thinking. Speaks and acts before he thinks. Do you know anybody like that? All around you, there are people who are just simple folk, Maybe don't even have a college education. Hardworking, no nonsense. They understand people, and they love Jesus with all their heart. That's Peter. But all oh, the journey of faith, he's going to go on. He's going to have moments where he's the one who tells everybody who Jesus is. And then he's going to have moments where Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. John MacArthur called him the disciple with the foot-shaped mouth. I love that Jesus picks Peter to be the chief of the twelve. He could have gone right to Paul. He could have found Paul. Been like, look, you've you got to be in charge of these knuckleheads. Okay, they need a lot of help. You're formally, biblically trained. No, he picked that guy last. Okay. I love that Peter was put in charge. We see Peter's heart. If you read the books, the letters he wrote, First and Second Peter, you see how Jesus formed within him later a shepherd's heart to care for the flock, a humble man who warned everyone else that Satan's prowling around you because he wants to destroy you. Peter is the chief leader of the twelve. Write this down. Andrew, we already met him. He's the leader in the shadow. Andrew's the leader in the shadow. <clears throat> He's one of the first to meet Jesus, but we don't really formally have a record of all that he did to build out the early church. The apostle Paul, the last apostle, got a whole book, the book of Acts, right? He got to write Romans. We know a lot about Paul. In fact, the book of Acts can be divided into two parts. Peter and Paul. Well, Andrew just fades into the shadow. Church historians say that Andrew made his way all the way up to what is today Russia, Ukraine, and Romania, was the first one to open up these great nations to the gospel. 
He may have traveled also deep into Africa, likely induced in, introduced entire regions to Christ. In the end, he was probably crucified on an X-shaped cross, like his brother Peter, upside down because of his ministry. They were both martyrs. Peter is the chief of the twelve. Andrew is the leader in the shadow. And that makes me wonder, maybe a lot of what we are going to do for Christ is going to be lost, buried in the sands of time. hundred years from now, nobody on earth might know anything you did for the church or the gospel. Praise God. The vast majority of the work is done in the shadows. Jesus himself didn't even go to the central empire of his day. He didn't go to Rome and glory himself. He, he was tucked away into this tiny little town, Bethlehem, this tiny little nation, Israel, in the back alleys of the Roman Empire. It's the nature of the kingdom of God. And so the vast majority of your work and mine is going to be in the shadows. Andrew shows that he was called for a very special role. Most of it would just be buried. James, write this down. James was the first to die. So Peter and Andrew were brothers. James and John were brothers. James is the first to die. He's the brother of John. Again, both of them fishermen, four of them fishermen. Jesus nicknamed the sons of thunder. So it says here, uh, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, verse 17, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name uh, Boanerges, that is the sons of thunder. Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas and James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus and Simon the zealot, Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Then he went home and the crowd gathered again. So this is the list. We're now on James, the first to die. His brother is John. Why did Jesus name them the sons of thunder? They're both hotheads. Do you know any brothers who are both hotheads? Anybody know them? Maybe you and your brother are both hotheads. They, uh, they had a reputation. They once asked Jesus, should we call down thunder from heaven to destroy these people? Truth people. John in his books was light and darkness, black and white. James, we don't know a lot about him, but when the king decided to start killing off the disciples, he picked James first, probably because of his mouth. Right, get him first, put him to death. Got in a lot of trouble. James was the first to die. He, along with the rest of the apostles, struggled with envy, selfishness, resented Peter, wanted to be the greatest. James and John embarrassingly brought Mama to help them out. Remember that story? Mama, to come talk to Jesus about how her boys should be at the right and the left hand of Jesus in his kingdom. Mama Thunder, Mama Thunder, going to get her boys to the top. He was the first to die, though. They may have been younger cousins of Jesus, Church tradition says that when James was led off to die, and this is not biblical, when I say church tradition says, it's not in the Bible, but this is what church tradition says, that when James was led off to be executed, the guard was so inspired by his faith, he also confessed as being a Christian, and the two of them were beheaded together. If it's true, it's amazing. It's handed down to us through church tradition. But James was the first to be killed. One of the greatest reasons why you should believe the gospel, that Jesus is the Christ, is because the early apostles didn't believe it. And then they were suddenly and sincerely converted. And they laid down their life for Christ. Some people will say, well, yeah, there's all sorts of cult weirdos who believe crazy things and maybe even die for it. This is different. No one would die for a lie if they knew it was false, if they knew the body had been stolen, if they knew Jesus was a fraud, they would not believe it and they would not lay down their life for it, especially when they were all on record as not believing it. Their sudden and sincere conversion to the gospel, despite their lack of belief, is one of the greatest reasons you should believe the gospel. James laid down his life. He was the first to die. John is the disciple Jesus loved. You can write that down. The disciple Jesus loved. He wrote, of course, the Gospel of John, the letters, and the book of Revelation. He's likely the only apostle to die of, natural, of a natural cause. Jesus foretold this to Peter after the resurrection. Jesus told Peter, when you're older, someone will stretch you out, lead you to where you don't want to go. 
Jesus knew their future, telling Peter he would get that martyr's death that he ruined when he fled. Peter always comparing, and they were all comparing. Well, what about him? Ah, if it's my will that I leave him to my coming, what's that to you? Hinting at the fact that John wouldn't go a, 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 a martyr's death, but he could die of a natural cause. Jesus could leave him longer. John was a failure like the rest. They all abandoned Jesus, but he was brave. He was the only one who stayed with Jesus in the courtyard all the way up until the cross. He was the only one who was a witness at the cross, and Jesus put him in charge of his mom. John was the disciple Jesus loved. Tertullian says the emperor plunged John into boiling oil in front of the Colosseum, and he was not harmed, and a great revival broke out in the Colosseum. It's again church tradition. It's church tradition. That could be why they banished him to the island of Patmos instead of trying to kill him again, because if they try and kill him, revival breaks out. Let's stop that. Backfire! Again, we don't know exactly, but we know that John would be probably the longest living disciple, wrote some of the most beloved works in the Bible. He was the disciple Jesus loved. Jot this down, Matthew, we met him last week, Levi, the tax collector. He wrote the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector and the people hated him. Crook, corrupt, thief, worked for the Romans, turned coat. Jesus picked him? We love that Jesus picked the tax collector because Jesus came last week, we learned, to save sinners, not the righteous, the sick, not the healthy. That's great news. That's the grace of God who calls sinners under repentance. Jesus will save the most sinful person on earth today if they would but turn and receive the grace of God. Isn't that great news? I love that Matthew's name means the gift of God. The gift of God. To somebody who likely was crooked, a thief, to somebody who was at least among those who were known for that, his name means the gift of God, and his salvation was not earned or not swindled. And no matter what he did in life, just like Zacchaeus, Jesus said, today salvation has come to this house. Isn't that great news? That the grace of God is for you? Matthew should challenge us to share the gospel with our most sinful friends. Matthew should challenge us to look around and see that there is no one beyond the grace of God. I love that Matthew filled his house with his most sinful friends last week. I kind of joked that it would be like if you had, you know, a Christmas party and you only invited all the IRS agents from your region. Who wants to be around tax collectors when there's a party going on? Matthew. He brought his sinful friends to Jesus. I love that. We met Peter, we met Andrew, we met James, we met John, we met Matthew. And they've inspired us to believe the gospel is true because their salvation, their faith in Christ is a great assurance that Jesus is Lord. Their foolishness, their fickleness, their selfishness, their envy, their failure shows us the nature of the grace of God. And their sudden and sincere turning to believe that Jesus rose from the grave it's one of the greatest proofs that it's true. The fact that they signed it in blood, died as martyrs, stayed faithful to the end, is one of the most impossible arguments to refute if you're an unbeliever. The best explanation for the faith of these men and their martyrdom is that the gospel is true. Even beyond their lives, their testimonies, they became miracle workers. They were able to heal the sick, raise the dead. They were able to perform wonders and cast out demons. Wow. Them? Jesus picked who? So we reviewed those we already met. Now let's meet a, few, meet a few more. Number two, you can write this down. Let's meet a few more. Let's meet Philip. Philip helped people to see Jesus. Now we already read their names, so now we're going to get a little help from the Gospel of John. So turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 43. John, chapter 1, verse 43. The rest of the sermon is going to be in the Gospel of John, where we meet these three. So in John 1, verse 43, maybe you notice this, but when you read the Gospel of John, he includes a ton of stuff in the first several chapters that is not in the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptics. So we find great stories in John about the early ministry of Jesus, the early calling of his disciples. So Philip helped people to see Jesus. It says in John 1, 43, we're, we're taking you all the way back to uh, 
after, maybe a year after Jesus was baptized, and then he went into the wilderness, and he was tested, and then um, he, he had some initial ministry, then he started to call his first disciples. We're right around that early phase in Jesus' ministry. It says in verse 43, the next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael, said to him, we have found him, of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So Philip immediately grabs his buddy, Nathanael, brings him to Jesus. I love reflecting on Philip. We don't know a ton about him, and also make sure you don't confuse him with later in the book of Acts, there's a Philip mentioned. That's not the same one. The deacon is not the same as the apostle. Sometimes they were, those were getting gotten, they were confused, even among early church history. Here's what we know about Philip. He was one of the first believers. That says a lot. When nobody else in the world believed in Jesus, Philip knew it was true. And he immediately went to tell people it was true. Jesus said, follow me. That is, as we learned last week, the only way any one of us is going to get to heaven. Jesus says, follow me. Philip followed him. He knew he was the Messiah, and he went to tell other people. What is it like to believe in Christ when there's nothing Christian on earth? Imagine that. Imagine being one of the first two or three or four people to ever become Christians. Here's a picture of some Christian things, okay? Imagine if none of these things had ever happened. Do you know uh, about a church? Never been to one, never seen one. What about Billy Graham? Never heard of him. Christmas stockings? Uh-uh. Do you have Chris Tomlin's greatest hits? Nope, never heard of him. Have you been to church camp? VBS? Have you heard of Martin Luther? I don't know what you're talking about. I have heard of nothing Christian at all. That's Philip. But he met Jesus. Jesus said, follow me. He knew. He's the one. He went and told people, guess what? We found the Messiah. Imagine being one of the first Christians when no one else in the world believed it. Philip believed it. And he helped people to see Jesus. What a story. He says here in verse 45, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth. Now, we covered this in many previous sermons. We went to where Moses said, there will be a prophet like me who comes. We went to way back to Abraham, and we saw how Abraham was a type of God, and his son was showing us that God would send his son. Abraham saw my day and was glad, Jesus would say. We learned that the Word of God, the law of God, Moses, and the prophets. We went to Isaiah. We went to Micah. We looked at the Psalms. We looked at David and how David had amazing prophecies of the death of Christ, the birth of Christ, the life, the ministry, the death of Christ. Hundreds of years before was talked about. 2000 B.C., 1500 B.C. We went to 700 B.C., 500. Jesus was prophesied throughout the Old Testament. Philip sees that. How was he convinced? Well, like most people in the New Testament, they were convinced by the Old Testament. So the Word of God IDs the Son of God. It's also the Spirit of God at work in these men, showing them the Messiah has arrived. John the Baptist was also a witness. It says in John 1, 29, the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Rich history there of the Lamb of God at Passover who was slain and the blood was put on the doorpost, right? Uh, there was sacrifice in the Old Testament that led to substitution, the covering over of the sin. There was also the Day of Atonement where the sins would be laid on the sacrificial animal and sent out into the wilderness. The one would be killed. There was this covering over of the sin that all, the sacrificial system all pointed to Jesus. He knew it. Right away, he said, come and see. I wonder, is that your heart? Are you one of those people who maybe as a child or a young adult, you heard it and you believed? Like, I, I knew it was true. 
I believed it early, and I, I told people. For, for many people, that's their story. They were quick to believe, and they were very natural in telling other people about it. Isn't it wonderful? Is that your heart? Do you have that faith of a child? Do you believe in Jesus? Do you tell other people naturally? If there were no other Christians in the world right now, nothing Christian on earth, would you still believe and serve Christ? Would you go and tell other people about him? Would you stand alone like that? I love the example Philip sets for us. Maybe you were one of the first to be saved in your family. Maybe you were one of the first to be saved at your job, on your street. Maybe you're the only Christian at your workplace right now. Philip should encourage you. He was one of the only ones. It didn't stop him. He went and told people. I love that. Throughout the Bible, Philip would bring people to Jesus. The Greeks would come and want to see Jesus. Philip would help bring them in. When the 5,000 showed up, Jesus kind of said to Philip, how do we feed so many? He gave him a little test. I don't know. How are we supposed to do this? He's really excited. Church tradition says Philip went on to be a missionary and ultimately was a martyr as well. What a story. Philip helped people to see Jesus. I hope his story helps you to see that we should believe the gospel because he believed it. The signs and the wonders, the healings and the miracles, the teachings of Philip authenticated the gospel. Then he invited this guy Bartholomew. You can write this down. Bartholomew, who's also Nathaniel. At first, he thought Jesus was trash. You can write that down. First, he thought Jesus was trash. <laughs> Let's read on in verse 45. We have found the one of whom Moses in the law and the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Like, it's like, do you have somebody who whenever you're really excited about something and you go tell them, they're just like, calm down, it's not that big of a deal. Mm. These two were buddies, and they're kind of like light and dark, okay? Like, Philip is like, he's here! One of the most exciting things in history. And, the, and his buddy is like, calm down. I, I don't believe it. So he says, come and see. And it says, Nathaniel said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nazareth was a town with a reputation. There are towns in our country, in our state, that have a reputation for being a lot of things that aren't good. Vegas, Sin City. San Francisco, lots of trouble. I think maybe like Flint, Michigan could be a city that for a variety of reasons, a collapsed government and economy because the industry left poverty crime polluted water every when you hear flint michigan you hear man that town's got a reputation not the kind of place i might want to go and live just given everything i've heard of it so it would be similar to someone saying we found the king of the world the one who's going to rule heaven jesus of flint huh of where what this this rusted out corrupt uh w w what like there I don't know what town you would assign, but Nazareth was yuck. Jesus was from there. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. I love Philip. Come and see. Come on. He wasn't like, oh, you know what? You're probably right. I should rethink this. Maybe I'm, yeah, I didn't even really think of it from that way. Maybe he isn't the Messiah. No, come and see. Bartholomew at first thought Jesus was trash. Nathaniel was initially disgusted by the thought that the Messiah could come from low-class Nazareth. Nothing good comes from there. How would the story play out? Verse 47. Jesus saw Nathaniel coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Okay, now they've never met before. This is the part where Jesus knows the heart of this man, Okay. So like, Al, you and I have met, right? But if you, if this is your first time at Anchor today and you walked in, I was like, Al Heisiga, ah, oh, a godly Dutch man. Everyone knows his virtue. You'd be like, have you been reading my mail? All right, this is the weird part of meeting someone you've never met when he knows not only your name, but your heart. Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Verse 48, Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now this gets even weirder, okay? 
Uh, there was no GPS. There was no satellite back then. There were no ring cams. Nathaniel was all alone. Something was going on between him and God. We're not told what it was, okay? Something was going on when Philip walked up. Something, something Jesus witnessed from afar, meaning he's omnipresent, all right? He's, he's omnipresent. He is where he isn't, all right? He is where he isn't. You might be a pretty incredible person. You're only in one place, okay? Jesus is all the places. He establishes his omnipresence here. I saw you when you were under the fig tree. I saw you. Nathaniel answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Do you see how quickly he turned? Nothing good can come out of Nazareth. That trashy town, I'm never going to believe it. Three seconds later, he is the one. The sudden and sincere conversion of the apostles because of witnessing the divinity of Jesus Christ is one of the greatest reasons you should believe it. They didn't believe it. Then Jesus did God's stuff. God's stuff. And they're like, he's the one. At first he thought Jesus was trash. Rabbi, you're the son of God. You're the king of Israel. <clears throat> Jesus answered him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe you'll see greater things than these? He said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you'll see heaven open, the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. I love that Nathaniel was converted quickly when he got a true glimpse into the majesty of Christ. Jesus said, you're going to see even greater things than that. Get ready. If you know your Old Testament, you know Jesus is referring here to a very famous Old Testament occurrence. He's talking about from Genesis 28, when Jacob was going, leaving, and boom, he spent the night in, in Bethel, and he had a vision, a dream, and he saw the Lord. He saw heaven, and he saw angels ascending and descending on this ladder, this stairway. He saw the Lord, and he woke up. He was like, surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. This is the gateway to God. This is, this is the gateway to heaven, and he called it Bethel. Jesus said, surely you're going to see greater things than this. You're going to see angels in, descending on the Son of Man. In other words, Jesus was claiming to be Bethel. He was claiming to be the intersection of heaven and earth. He was claiming to be the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. He was confirming for Nathaniel that Jesus, even though he didn't know it or see it, Jesus was that Bethel. Jesus was that unseen gateway to God. He's now encountering him. It's a majestic, beautiful claim of Christ to divinity. The titles also show us exactly who Jesus was claiming to be. Nathaniel said, you're the son of God, the king of Israel, the Messiah. And this understanding of him being this heaven opened and the, the angels ascending and descending, I saw the Lord Jacob said, I saw the Lord. Jesus is claiming to be the Lord of heaven. It's amazing. You'll see greater things than this. Jesus is the gateway to God. He's, he's the Son of Man. The last title there, the Son of Man, refers to the prophecy of Daniel, the divine king who will rule God's kingdom for eternity. So looking back, looking ahead, you see Jesus in all of his glory. Nathaniel at first thought Jesus was trash, and then he was saved. Nathaniel may have died the most gruesome death of all of the apostles. We aren't sure, it's church history, but church tradition says that Nathaniel would be flayed alive, which means they took all of his skin off while he was still alive. Some said it was even worse than that. He was flayed and crucified and beheaded. There are many gross statues and paintings that commemorate this death of Nathaniel. The martyrdom of these men, their sudden and sincere conversion to Christ, the miracles and the wonders that they performed should convince you Jesus is the Messiah. Rabbi, you are the Son of God, the King of Israel, the divine ruler, the gateway to heaven. Is that what you believe? Are you convinced? Is that your faith? Nathaniel at first thought Jesus was trash. Then he was convinced. So we've got Philip, 
He helped people to see Jesus. We've got Nathaniel. At first, he thought Jesus was trash. Finally, we've got Thomas. Write that down. Doubting Thomas. He had to see it to believe it. He had to see it to believe it. Doubting Thomas, of course, was skeptical. Though all the apostles doubted and fled, Thomas was like extra skeptical. He, he really didn't believe. So Thomas, uh, he comes up in this story. And uh, we are going to go to 20, verse 26. John 20, verse 26. And let's hear about Thomas, who's mentioned as one of the apostles. John 20, verse 26. Actually, in verse 24. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came, meaning when he appeared after the crucifixion and resurrection. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. I will never believe. Thomas had a hard time believing it. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're skeptical. Maybe you're, maybe you're more logical. Maybe you need proof. Maybe you're like, yeah, I don't think so. Even after Jesus rose from the grave, Thomas was like, unless I see it with my own eyes and touch him, I will never, ever believe it. I love that Thomas was called to be an apostle because there's many people who are highly skeptical about things of faith. I was highly skeptical when I heard about the gospel. I needed to be convinced. And there are many other people like me. Here's a picture of some apologists, some great thinkers who... Um, really weighed the evidence of the truth and, and put together wonderful proofs. that They came to Christ through a method of evaluation and assessment. William Lane Craig, Nancy Piercy, Norm Geisler, Josh McDowell, uh, C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis got converted in the sidecar of his brother's motorcycle on the way to a zoo. That's how he got saved. John Lennox got saved, and he went to Oxford, and immediately the professors tried to tell him, you can't be a Christian and a successful teacher here, and he stuck to his guns. He's now debated um, one of the four horsemen of the new atheism. I forget which one. Uh, Lisa Fields, Lee Strobel was a reporter for, what was it, the Tribune, the Sun-Times, uh, sought out to interview people to disprove the gospel, became a Christian, and wrote The Case for Christ, The Case for Faith. So I love that Jesus saves doubters like Thomas, doubters like these people, doubters like me. And listen, Jesus convinced Thomas. If you're more of a skeptical person, if you honestly bring your doubts and your objections to Christ and you give the Bible a fair hearing and you're open to the reasons to believe, you should become a Christian too. Christianity has satisfied some of the most brilliant minds throughout history. And I love that Thomas had to touch him with his own hands and Jesus obliged Eight days later, verse 26, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Put out your hand, place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, If you believe because you have seen me, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. These men give us amazing evidence that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, the King of Heaven, the one who will rule forever. They did signs and wonders and exercised demons and performed miracles and wrote scripture. You should believe the gospel. The two takeaways I have for you would be the first one is, are you a born-again follower of the Lord Jesus Christ? Whatever reason you have for not believing, the apostles should convince you the gospel is true. They didn't believe it, and they were convinced you should be convinced too. They authenticated the truth of the gospel. Also, we should all say, Lord, send us out. Apostle means sent out. We should become sent ones. Lord, here we are. Send us. Lord, use me to share the gospel with somebody today. These men laid down their lives and died the death of martyrs to show that the faith is, is worth their ultimate sacrifice. We should be able to go put some information on windshields or in mailboxes. We should be able to talk to a neighbor openly. We're so free in this country. We have so little reason to fear expressing our faith to other people. They should inspire us to become bold witnesses 
of Christ. So are you willing, this is the best time of the year to invite people to church, Thanksgiving and Christmas. Are you willing, we've got a table set up in the lobby, to grab a little stack of door hangers or little invites. Are you willing to invite somebody to church next week? Are you willing to take that risk knowing it's not going to cost you much? And to say, hey, look, there are people all around me who don't know that Jesus is the Son of God, the Bethel, the gateway to heaven. They are not going to heaven after they die. You could change that. Are you willing to become a brave, courageous witness of the Lord Jesus Christ, just like these men? Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer right now as the worship team comes back up. Jesus, we thank you for the apostles you chose. They were not a dream team. You chose fishermen, you chose tax collectors, you chose doubters. Lord, it's amazing the team that you built because they were nobodies. They were fools. They were cowards. Lord, they were, they were selfish, just like us. So thank you for giving us the confidence that you could use people like us to turn our world upside down. Lord, I pray that you would give us the courage and the boldness to invite people to church, to tell them about Jesus. The kingdom of God is at hand. Use us, O Lord, to testify of your greatness. And Lord, I pray that you would bless anybody here today who has never believed the gospel. They have never answered the call to become followers of Christ. Right here and right now, may they stop doubting and believe. May they realize that if if these men, these apostles, were willing to die rather than turn from you, it must be true. It must be true. The Gospels must be true. Jesus, you convince them of your divinity, of your resurrection, of your ascension, where you are ruling and enthroned at the right hand of God right now. They all believed it, and they would rather die than deny you. May that convince some right here that it's true. It must be true. That's the only explanation. And may they stop doubting and believe in their own hearts. May they say, Jesus, you are my Lord and my God. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.